It's Monday, the 10th of January. Last week was a pussy week. It was a write-off. You know, people's heads were in their ass. It was snowing. The numbers were high. You were waiting online for COVID tests, your results. Thank God the hoop landed. It's the fucking 10th. It's the first full week of the year, and we're going straight fucking ahead. It was a great weekend. I'm feeling great. I'm looking great. I'm tip-top motherfucking Magoo. My balls smell great. I'm back, bitches. It's a new year with a new motherfucking attitude. I'm sorry about the podcast last week. They were a little off. You know, I was a little off from the fucking COVID mind. I have no fucking idea what was going on with me last week, guys. So uh, I have an idea. I, I ran out of medication. I was getting bad headaches. I thought it was the COVID. I thought it was the fucking medication. I thought it was the vapor pen. You know, so I had to start slicing shit off. My headaches went away, and uh, I'm ready for 2022, regardless of what the fuck's going to happen with this or that. It's got nothing to do with us. Uh, today I do have a fucking guest. I've been really waiting for this guy. We, uh, I'll tell you the story. In 19 fucking 90, October 1990, I got separated. By December, January, I had lost my job with my family, the roofing company and the whole, you know, shebang. I, I had nothing going on. I was doing some comedy. I started comedy in 91. Uh, we was yeah, we got separated, I'm sorry, in uh, October of 91. And, um, you know, I had no family. I, I really had nothing. I lost my job. But when I got out of prison, I was in the halfway house, and I got a job at a place called the Puddle Car Wash in Boulder. Tremendous. They had hired me when I first moved to Boulder. That uh, December of 86, they hired me to dry off cars. That shit builds character, Jack. You're out there with two fucking towels in Boulder, Colorado. There's a line around the fucking block, and you got to dry off fucking cars. And, you know, the people give you tips, and you, you steal one when the, they're not looking. There's a little box, and you put... It was a great job. You got tips at the end of the day. You know, you got like 40 bucks in tips. There's 20 gorillas out there. The guy was great. Bob, the owner... By now, he's probably fucking on to the next level of life. He punched the ticket. His wife was great. I worked there with a black dude. He was a tremendous football player at CU named Howard. My boss there, his name is Richie. Fucking great people, man. And uh, I worked there for about um, uh, six weeks the first time, from uh, December to like mid-January. And then I got a job at Boulder Auto Body. That's where I met fucking Tidwell. And then the plan of the kidnapping came along. But we'll get to that later. And uh, it was, you know, I was lost. But when I worked at this, when I got out of the halfway house, I, I needed a job. I had knocked up my ex-wife. I needed something that made money. And one day, Rich, great guy from New York, called me and he goes, listen, I got a position for you. You're going to make some money. You work three days a week. You probably walk out of here with a grand a week. You know, that's great money. And sometimes there's Saturdays. Sometimes there's overtime, blah, 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 blah. And it's just great. You're outside. You're talking to people. And I, I took the job. I had to, you know. And I, it was a great fucking job. You stood outside with a fucking pad. People pull up. They ask you for the special, and you got to try to upsell. You know, rims, undercarriage, armor all, fucking. You know, the car scent. It, it was great. And I got to meet a lot of fucking people. I got to meet like Boulder undercover cops because the sheriff's department would wash their cars there, so now I, I knew all the undercovers from Boulder County Sheriff's Office. <clears throat> I ended up meeting Bill Wise there. If you look up Bill Wise, he was with the DA in Boulder when, uh, what's the fucking name? The little kid, John Bonet Ramsey, he was part of that thing. I met a bunch of those cops. The chick that did the, the reason why they couldn't prosecute the Ramseys, she was a lesbian cop, great lady, great lady. She was like a fucking sergeant. She's probably like a captain now. I think I saw her on TV a couple of years ago. I know her. And uh, she, she, uh, she no, she's a great lady. She went into the fucking uh, John Bonet house and did a fucking circle prayer. You know, so they fucked up the evidence so they couldn't really do nothing. Barry Sheck was on fire from the OJ trial with the DNA shit. So she, anyway, but one of the best. People, I, I also met the Feebles in there, the other Cuban family in Boulder. I met the, the wrestler, whatever his fucking name was. The Oh, my God. Uh, the ultimate fucking whatever his warrior. name. The ultimate warrior was there once without his makeup on. I recognized him. He was fucking yoked. It was just a great, you know how it is. It was 91. 
I was 28 years old, 29 years old, you know, and I'm outside fucking making dough. I was a big shot. I was in the halfway house, you know, I had to hide money. I made tips, you know, because I cut deals with people. But uh, one of the f best guys I met in there was I, I would sit there all day and guys would come in to wash their cars. And these, as we, these one group of guys would come in all the time. New Yorkers, all from Long Island, fucking heavy duty guys, Acuras, you know, fucking uh, 280Zs. These guys all had great cars. And they, were, they looked like they were making a great living. And we'd talk and they were, they'd always come in just to talk to me to hear the New York accent. They'd say, we love going down there. So when they asked him, I go, Doug, what do you fucking guys do that you drive all these cars and shit? And they go, we're in the sports business. So I, I thought it was a sports betting business. I didn't know what the fuck it was. And I'm like, guys, if you ever need somebody, I tortured these guys for about a year. Then I moved on. I quit the job. I, I focused on comedy, whatever. I was, you know, I was just fucking around. I was divorced. So what else did I have going on? And one day, like in July, one of those guys text me, you know, text me, page me. I was the pager man, like in the wire. It was all pages and shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started watching that show again, brilliant. If you haven't seen the wire, it's time you watch it again. I'm up to episode eight, and we're going straight to episode 64. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, this guy Richie came in, there was a guy Rizzo, and there was a guy George, and they would always come in, and one day finally, they contact him and they go, do you want a job where we work? Before you go for the job, it's seven days a week. You work August 15th till Super Bowl, no weekends. You work every fucking day. You work, the only day you have off is Wednesday, and that's if you're lazy. Most of the people came in. That was the work ethic they expected from you. They were fucking heavy-duty New Yorkers. So I told Richie, I go, yeah, you know, set up an interview. I went there. I talked to the guy. They all interviewed me. A week later, they called. They said, you got the job. Come in August 15th for training. It was fucking unreal, like, to be around New Yorkers all day. I went in there for training. They would cater the fucking training sessions, great food, sandwiches. I'm flat broke. I'm doing comedy. I went in there for, that was how I ate breakfast. Like, I was the first guy there because they had bagels. They would get bagels shipped in from fucking New York on Sundays. These, if you worked on the weekends, these guys took care of you. Like, there was food there, you know. It was just great. Pizzas, they did everything. They did. They really tried, but they trained you for two weeks. They really sat with you and worked thoroughly with you. And it was just a standard pitch. I don't know if any of you guys have ever sold anything on the phone or anything. It was just a standard pitch, you know. Uh, and but you were always closing. Like I didn't know. I thought I was a fucking salesman. I had sold cars and shit like that. I thought I knew what I was doing. I knew nothing. I'd read a book, Telemarketing, in the 80s before I got that job. You could throw that book out the fucking window. Great book. It applied to me for different areas and stuff like that. But these guys taught me how to fucking sell. Objections. You know, right now I'm taking jujitsu and I'm doing core program. That means you do like Simon Tell uh, drills. You break the guard. You know, they teach you shit. It's basically nice and light until you get to the blue belt program and it's exactly what i need i'm an old man i wanted to get my strength for maybe 90 days just going there and drill 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 what i've noticed about drilling is that now when somebody touches me with something i go right for an arm bar or i go for a kimura it's a great way to teach somebody and that's the same way these guys worked with you it was fucking thorough and then for a week you just call people with them listening and it was hilarious like they would come up to you and tell you what to fucking say Sometimes they'd pick up the phone while you were talking to somebody and talk to that person like if it was you and the person on the other side didn't know. I had learned stuff that was blowing my fucking mind. Like every time I leave there, but I had a problem. My cocaine addiction was on fucking fire. Like I was on fire. Then I had a single, I was single, I had a basement apartment in North Hollywood. I could walk to the fucking job. It was on like Iris. Fucking office was great. We were in a mall with Abos Pizza, Ladizio, Murphy's Bar and Grill, a barbershop place underneath. I mean, guys, it was a dream come true. I had I was I couldn't give it all my attention because of comedy and because of what I was going through with the separation and divorce. The first year I did I did okay. You know, they said that the first year you're going to have your humps and your bumps. You learn rejection. But you grinded, brother. You fucking grinded. And if you listen 
to what they said to you. You wouldn't make money. Once you started doing what you wanted, you're not going to make fucking money. But you had to be very aggressive. You know, it's like uh, you had to sell sports information. And, yeah, we won. We won a lot. But there's a week, you know, when you have you have the ups and lo- you know ups and downs and anything, especially fucking gambling. I was always involved with gambling because of my family, but I had learned a complete different fucking world of gambling and how they approached it. They analyzed the gambler psychologically. These guys have put a lot of money into what they did. They knew what they were doing, but what they taught me was to fucking always be selling and be aggressive. I was always kind of aggressive, not with my sales, because I don't like to, for salespeople to be aggressive with me. But for this particular job, you're working with fucking gamblers, and it's a different psychology, and they had tapped into it. These guys from Long Island, this guy Stu Finer, he's no fucking Yale graduate, but he's got balls of steel and a mind to make fucking dough. And anyway, I did three years with them. You know, I did uh, 93. The first year they fucking fired me because of my cocaine problem. I would just go in there with a napkin in my nose and I was all fucking clogged up all the time. You can't sell when you're clogged up. Then he gave me a second chance. He's a great guy, those guys. Let me tell you what they would do, man. I would work six months. Whatever money you put away, they'd match it. Then they'd break it up into the six months you were going to be off and every month you got a check. That's what I didn't tell you when I told you I was delivering Chinese food. I would deliver Chinese food, do comedy, and get a check from them, and that would pay my rent, my child support. That's how much they took care of their fucking people. This was a tremendous company. I had a great opportunity with them. I fucking blew it. But it brought me back. After I got divorced, I was lost. This brought me back. I was around guys every day talking about pussy, yelling at people. Fuck you. Grab your fucking credit card. We called my room the Voodoo Lounge because they had like different rooms. And we had like a fucking crazy room in the back. They called it the Voodoo Lounge. We'd be eating, yelling. They had girls in there that would give you the paperwork, college girls. It was just a, a great time, you know. And then January of 95, my plan was to work till uh, January of 95. And then I was trying to get on the road, you know. At that time, I was doing, like, shit one-nighters and stuff, but I was working, you know, not every fucking day. And i never forget, um, the big, like, I had never worked a full week. Like, I had never worked a full week. I always worked, like, a Saturday or Tuesday. So after you become an open micer and you get up a little bit, you get, like, 20 minutes, you call a guy, if you're on the West Coast, you call a guy named David Tribble. If you're a comic, you know what that name is. David Tribble books the Pacific Northwest, and it's Tribble Runs. Tribble Runs is how you learn how to do comedy. It's hand-to-hand comedy. You don't know what's going to happen until you get there. When you get there, the, the manager gives you a fucking piece of paper, and it says this room is active. If somebody throws a bottle at you, call the management and go to your room. You know, this is this type of comedy. But I was ready for it, and I'll never forget that one night while I was at work at the the sports betting service, they called me and they said, we we have a fallout in Boulder, the Tribble run. If you could do it tonight, Tribble wants to see a report and if everything pans out, you're on the road with Tribble. I was in fucking shock. I'm like, I made it. So I told the guys and we all went down. It was a Tuesday night. Boulder broker was on Tuesday nights. By that time, I had been fired. I was the house MC for about a year there. By that time, I had been fired. They, I had to get special permission to go back and do comedy. They welcomed me. They're like, yeah, come back. Oh, my God, you're the feature. Oh, my God, this is phenomenal. I forget who the headliner was, but I went down there. All the guys from the office came. That was the camaraderie you had. Like For the first time in years, I was fine. These guys came, cheered, they bought food, we drank. It was fucking tremendous. I ended up getting, like, I did great. And next thing you know, the guy called me and said, you're on the road. And it was rough to quit that fucking job. But it was time for me to do comedy. And it was also time for me to, by that time, I knew that I wasn't going to do anything in Boulder. But the three football seasons I worked at, what Stu Finer and his staff taught me was invaluable. Invaluable. I learned about people. I learned that people always bullshit you. I learned the mind of the gambler. But most importantly, I learned how to sell from the fucking balls. And that came in seven years later. 
because you could be the best comic in the world, but if you don't know how to sell your fucking product, you got dick. You know, how many, what are you going to call people and say, I'm funny, sell your fucking product, cocksucker. This guy taught me how to sell. I recently moved to Jersey and uh, Jimmy Florentine works for Barstool Sports. And one day I saw that Stu Finer was on there. So I got emotional, you know, I was like, wow, fucking Stu still at it. I know Stu in 91, he was in it already 10 fucking years, probably, since he was like 10, 10. this motherfucker is aggressive as fuck. And here we are, 2021, and Stu's still there yelling, fucking believing in himself. And for a guy like me, dog, that's fucking inspiring. That's inspiring. He tells a great story, and I hope you fucking enjoy it.